Good evening, I'm Sherry Cosby, the Library Director here at the Oceanside Public Library. The Big Read is one of our most exciting programming events that we do, and we are a proud recipient of our sixth Big Read. The Big Read is made possible through the National Endowment of the Arts and Arts Midwest. The idea behind the Big Read is to strike up a conversation surrounded by a book. This year, the Oceanside Public Library chose Into the Beautiful North by Luis Alberto Urea. It's a character-driven drama based on the lives of Nayeli, Tacho, Vampi, Yolo, and Atomico as they leave their home of Tres Camarones, Mexico in search of seven men that will help save their town. One moment you might be crying, the next minute you might be laughing. It's just a wonderfully written story. This event tonight is made possible through the generosity of the Friends of the Oceanside Public Library and the Oceanside Public Library Foundation. We also want to thank Paulina Castro from Telemundo 20 for being our moderator. Please enjoy their conversation. Thank you. Bueno, hola. Let's start. Hola, Luis. Um, it's so nice to be here with you. It's to... it's good to be here. Yes. Though things changed fast, you know. Apparently, Oceanside is closing down, kind of like the rest of the country. I know. But I I told everybody I'm wearing my my official coronavirus shirt <laughs> to represent that we couldn't meet, you know, the audience. What tonight. would Atomico do in what this situation? What would Atomico? He would hit the virus with his stick. We need him. is stronger than the, than the virus. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about your book, Into okay. the Beautiful North. Um, I, I, I was lucky enough to be listening to your book while crossing the border every day. No way. Yes. So I was very impressed about all the details that you have about Tijuana and like... And just Hometown. The, ex yeah. So we're from Tijuana. Tijuana. <laughs> Tijuana. Tijuana rules. <laughs> Yeah, I was born in Tijuana. We were just talking before we started. Um, my family is from Colonia Independencia, mm -hmm. but we're actually from Sinaloa originally, nice. from a town called Rosario, Sinaloa, mm -hmm. which became Tres Camarones in the book. Oh. Because everybody has a weird sense of humor in Rosario, mm -hmm. and it's, it's inexplicable to other people. But um, they would think being called Tres Camarones is funny because it's so stupid, you know, un pueblo que inspirado por Tres Camarones. And I was actually thinking, like, maybe this does exist. No, no. no. Because we have weird names in, in Mexico. Oh, especially Sinaloa. They have a name I probably can't say on air. Oh, really? That, yeah. It's about, um, how do I put this? It's about feces on a stick. No. The, oh, yeah. The town was named, always named Palo. Really? No, yeah. <laughs> and it, people got offended That's by it. That's very funny. So then they started calling it Palo Sucio. Uh, and now they call it Nombre Feo. Nombre Feo. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when the, when the actual historical reality of a place is so full of humor, mm -hmm. you know, and magic. For example, there's a movie theater in here on Cine Pedro Infante. Mm -hmm. That was my uncle's movie theater. Really? Oh, yeah. In Sinaloa? In Rosario, Sinaloa. It's still there, but it's all old now and run. Yeah. it's gone. But the building is still there. We were just there at New Year's. That's amazing. And, um, you know, if you can imagine, me as a little boy, I, I first went to... I was, I was, like I said, I was born in Tijuana, raised in San Diego, mm -hmm. originally Barrio Logan in National City, nice. and moved up to Claremont. Mm -hmm. But um, my dad started wanting me to be more Mexican. Mm. It's like I was getting too gringo you know? <laughs> and, and so he took me down there. And if you can imagine this magic of going to this town, I'd never thought, you know, mm -hmm. un pueblo mexicano yeah. with all this madness going on and animals and you know, borrachos and ghost stories and my cousins and my uncle. And my uncle published the newspaper, owned the radio station, and owned Cine Pedro Infante. Wow. And they had grown up with Pedro Infante. So I felt like I went from, you know, housing projects in Barrio Logan to with these powerful Mexicanos. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen that before. 
And so we got to go to the movies every night for free. Oh, that's so amazing. Yeah, and that's where the ideas started coming for this book, years later. Um, and as we were saying earlier, people have no idea the real people that are in the novel. And that's amazing because I was feeling that I could actually go and visit these places. Oh, yeah, let's go. Yeah, that would be nice you you have to go. have a, like a tour um, in the cities because when I was, well, no, I live in Tijuana and I was like, wow, I, I'm, I'm actually in Tijuana when I'm reading the book. And it feels nice because it's, you explain a lot. And I would like to know the selection of characters that you have in the book. Okay, it's right. so interesting. I'm like a, a group of girls and their gay friend. Mm -hmm. Tacho, mm. that are about to save Tres Camarones si. or, or bring these warriors, no, or look for these warriors to bring them back. So why did you decide to choose girls and this gay character? It's... Well, there's a funny thing that happens when you publish a lot of books. And uh, one of the books I published was this nonfiction book about the border called The Devil's Highway. Mm -hmm. um, and so reporters would send me their articles. And I thought, I'm, I don't want to write another nonfiction book about the Border Patrol, La Frontera. I, I did that. Mm -hmm. I want to move on. But they'd keep sending me their articles. And there was that time, you'll probably remember this, probably around 2003, maybe, or so, 2004, uh, five when so many men had left that there were pueblos without men, mm -hmm. all right? And there were these moments when there were uh, female mayors for the first time, you know, female school directors. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the stories was about the first female movie projectionist, una mujer working the machines at a movie theater. Um, and I, uh, woman police chief. And so... This guy sent me his article about a dance. You know how we love dances in mm -hmm, Mexico. Mm -hmm. It was a school dance. And the girls in one preparatoria had no boys to dance with. And the girls in the next town had no boys left to dance with. So they invited those girls to come. And mm -hmm. they brought them in buses. And las muchachitas estaban bailando, you know. Really? And there was this picture that was both funny and sad to me of two girls dressed up, dancing, but holding each other far away. But, you know, <laughs> but at least they were dancing. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I was, you know, I was sitting around thinking about it. I had done that Devil's Highway book, and I had done The, the Hummingbird's Daughter, which took 26 years. Wow. Mucho trabajo. Sí. And I, I wanted to have fun. I, I thought, yeah. let me write a book just to see if I can laugh every day. Mm -hmm. And I, I never, I didn't know if it would be published or not, okay? Mm -hmm. So I started playing, and I thought, hmm, so if, if Rosario Sinaloa, if all the men were gone, who would be the mayor? And I thought, my tia Irma. <laughs> and my tia Irma is tia Irma in this book. Mm -hmm. Wow. And she was Mexico's international bowling champion, the number one woman bowler in the history of Mexico. So that fact is true. Irma Urrea. Oh, yeah, look her up. Wow. You can Google my tia. That's so nice. It was the meanest person I ever knew in my life. Oh, really? I was terrified at the age. But at the end, oh, well, when I was reading, she's so funny. Oh, all Urreas are very funny. Really? And oh, yeah. And she kind of reminds me, I don't know. And I know this book was written in 2009 or published. Published. But, yeah. um, but she reminds me of like a, kind of like a Donald Trump, but in a lady. <laughs> like she's, but it, it, but backwards, you know, it's like, well, no, uh, yeah, I can see. Mexico I mean, is the best. Yeah. She, no, no one can. Yeah. She was very conservative. Um, and this 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 character in the book is very conservative. There, there's a there. I know exactly what you're referring to. There's a moment when she gives this impromptu speech about Mexico. We got to build a wall. We got to stop those Guatemalans. Exactly. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I actually heard that in Guadalajara. I was down there at the book festival in Guadalajara mm -hmm. in a cab, and there was a Mexican talk radio guy 
saying that. Just like Rush Limbaugh. I, I told my friends his name must have been Rush Limbazo because he yeah. sounded just like Rush, but he was talking in Spanish about Hondurans, Guatemaltecos, wow. Salvadoreños, and he was saying, you know, they're coming here to take our jobs. They're coming here to get benefits. Mm. They're coming here to get an education. Mm -hmm. They're bringing diseases. Sounded familiar. And there was, of course, no Trump on the horizon, but I thought that's, mm. an, that's an ironic, you know, an, that just people need to know that that happens all over the world. And, and apparently all the time, Luis, no? Because it never it stops. Feels, it never it stops. feels like you, you published this like two years ago or less. That's because I'm a genius. Yes, you can see <laughs> the future of that. <laughs> no, but there are themes that, that don't go away. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was thinking, who, who would be mayor? Like I said, it'd be Tia Irma. And mm -hmm. so I started thinking about Tia Irma. Yeah, she'd be a great mayor. and She's this wild character, but what's the story? And I remembered, it's in the book, And it's funny because so many young people read this book and they have no idea who this person is anymore, but Yul mm -hmm. Brynner. Mm -hmm. Yul yeah. Brynner, the movie star. So my tia and my, her sister, my tia Flaca, mm -hmm. tia Leti, they got into a fight one day in Tijuana and I was watching. And my tia Irma announced the best Mexican movie star of all time. <laughs> Era Yul Brynner. Right? <laughs> Yul Brynner. Yul Brynner. And my tia Flaca said, are you crazy? Jill Brenner is not Mexican. Mm -hmm. And tia Irma said, I have bowled all over the world. And I saw his house in Puerto Vallarta. Es Mexicano. Right? Really? That's cool. It was so stupid. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that fits the kind of comedic tone. So I thought, so what would her first act then be as mayor? A Jill Brenner film festival. Right? And I'm thinking, that's funny. I was just like this that's with a cup funny. of coffee, just thinking, you know. <laughs> so uh, is your Aunt Irma alive? Mm -mm. Still? No, so she never... Pero sabes que? Okay. You'll appreciate this. She died at 95 years old. Wow. While bowling. No. That's an awesome death, uh, even though it's weird. No, but, you know, that's, I tell audiences that's I want to go that way, too. I want to be typing one day and, oops, I'm gone. You know, she was Doing teaching a young man how to bowl. Mm. Gone. So that happened. And so I thought, okay, uh, a, a Yul Brynner Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And then these ideas started spinning in my head. And I thought, the man who owns the theater likes Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen, they call him in the book. And so he's trying to figure out Jewel Brenner and Steve McQueen, the Magnificent Seven. They show, and that's when all of a sudden the story clicked. I thought, there are all these high school girls. The men are gone. The boys are gone. They're at the big film festival. They're laughing at the Western. But Nayeli sees what's going on. Because Nayeli works at Tacho's Taqueria. Mm -hmm. And they have just been visited by two narcos mm -hmm. who are now going to come into the town. And she wants to stop this. Um, so the, the whole book just start, this happened at that moment. And it went from a joke to a novel. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the, the fascination for me partially is, you know, philosophically was... Um, You know, you have a million heroes' journeys, right? You're always reading about heroes. Mm -hmm. Galahad, mm -hmm. King Arthur, Beowulf, Mad Max, yeah. you know, John Wayne movies. But where are, the, where are the heroines? Where's the heroine's journey? You can read, you know, you can read Joseph Campbell about heroes' journeys. So mm -hmm. I thought, what if we took the template of the classic hero and gave it to this young woman. That's amazing. And so if you look at it that way, you see that she starts out innocent, and, mm -hmm. but is faced with a, tri a, a trial in which she has to save her people. So she goes forth into an alien land. A lot of the journeys are at night. She faces enemies. She has to fight evildoers, maybe even dragons. In those stories, there's always a, a, a kind of a journey into death. They have to go underground. She has to go through a narco tunnel. And that happens. Yeah. And I was also going to ask you about the way your characters cross the border is so peculiar. It's not like the usual desert path that they have to take through Arizona or some other place. And I thought that was, that was very creative, what you did with the girls 
and then also with Tacho. That's Tacho. amazing because that can happen if you're. It still happens. And it still happens. Yeah, you can go over to Libertad. Reveal, but... Yeah, no, shh. But <laughs> you people go from Libertad, you know, and they 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 also end up you know doing the the tunnel. Um, mm-hmm. But what was interesting to me were a couple of things. Tacho is also a real person. Tacho's alive. Really? Yes. So most of your characters are alive. A lot of them. A lot really? of them are made up, but Tacho's for real. Um, uh, Tacho lives in Rosario. Um, and you have to understand, like I said, my dad took me to Sinaloa to make me más mexicano, <laughs> which means más macho, sí, right? of course. Um, but Tacho was in this little town, and he was gay and out. In 1970, he, it, you know, he was a slender... So you could tell that he Ooh. he was bullied by the, oh, the people in the but city. But the thing about Tacho was he came out and then he, he got ferocious. Mm. They used to call him Tachito el Machito. So that was true. Oh, yeah. And he would say, ya, yeah, y que, andale. You know, que vas a hacer, que vas a hacer. And they'd be like, oye, calmate, cabrón. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I thought he was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, they were amused by him, but they thought I was a weird hippie freak El güero with the long hair that they didn't like coming from California yeah and I'd wear beads you know and they're like Led <laughs> Zeppelin they were like ¿Qué es esto? and my uncle and my father made this decision that Luis is never to meet Tacho oh le tenían miedo you know don't ever let him meet Tacho so in 1980 mm-hmm. I was there and my girl cousins were going to another baile okay and they said Luis we're going to go buy some fashions. It was Christmas Eve. I said, you're going to buy fashions tonight? And they said, yeah, we're going to Tacho's house. He sells girls' dresses. I was like, and they said, you want to meet Tacho? I said, yeah. I oh, so you've heard about him, but you... I watched him. I told you. I used to watch him in the street. Ah, okay, but never talked to him. Never met him. Okay. So we went to his apartment. We had a great time. A lot of his jokes are things Tacho said to me. So I knew then that on this journey... What would be really interesting was to be able to have a woman and a man who loved each other completely, but without sex or romance. Mm-hmm. Pero just un cariño entre personas, mm-hmm. you know, That's nice. a unity. Mm-hmm. They loved each other, and they both loved Johnny Depp. So they think one of us is going to get Johnny Depp. We, <laughs> when you know. we cross. So then, Luis, are you Matt in the book, or who's no Matt? Matt. No, no, you're not the. I'm a Tommy Coloca. <laughs> No, no, no. Matt's a gringo, man. Mm-hmm. I was very surprised by the development of that character mm. because I don't know why I was expecting so much when, when, when the girls used to talk about him and what he did and how he was so charming and then just being in Claremont Mesa and being in his reality was a surprise. He was having a hard time. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to... You probably know this, but I used to work with misioneros in Tijuana. I was with a missionary crew for a very long time. Oh, That's where I learned about witness and the Tijuana garbage dump. It's not like, you know, we all know how people live in the garbage dump automatically. I lived with those people for years. And I was going to ask you, why did you decide to put the characters in that spot in Tijuana? Like I- Because they, they came to Tijuana as outsiders, as people from outside of Tijuana do. Mm. That's who's in the dump. Gente que no pudo. They get to Tijuana and it's too much for them or they don't know, they can't, especially now as Tijuana mm-hmm. gets more and more sophisticated because yeah. you and I both know yeah. it's becoming quite an amazing city and it's got, mm-hmm. you know, an art scene and fashion scene and wine and fancy coffees yeah, and poetas course. and Nortec <laughs> Collective, my beloved bros, you know. Um, so, so what was interesting to me was the opportunity, because again, it's all part of the heroine's journey mm. in, in this, mm-hmm. so that her little army of girlfriends betray her. The hero has to be betrayed and wounded until at the end it is in solitary challenge against the forces. Mm. So that when she goes back, mm-hmm. she's a warrior herself. She's not a little girl. She's a Totally. Okay. Mm-hmm. So... Um, they all remembered Missionary Matt, and that was based on a couple of the surfer boy hueritos. Uh-huh. 
mm-hmm. who would go to Mexico and flirt with all the girls, and they'd never really been with güeros. You know, they're like, "Oh, he's so cute." Mira, you know, his nose is peeling. He's so cute. You know? <laughs> they look so different. Yeah, they do, and they act different. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys I was thinking of, who was the model for him, had been a really good friend of mine. And I didn't realize till after the book came out that he had sadly actually gotten into drugs and he had oh. died. So it was kind of weirdly prophetic, you know. I yeah. just was thinking those trajectories for those guys. And so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that that's what. But no, it had nothing to do with me. It was actually a portrait of, of other people that I watched. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because my relationship was much different. I was the translator for the group. And as soon as all the kids knew I was from Tijuana, yeah. it was a completely different thing. Like of acceptance in a different oh, way? Oh, yeah. Or? I was, okay. you know, I was like Tio Luis, you know? Oh. And we'd spend hours talking and telling stories and, mm-hmm. and jokes and stuff. These guys needed me to translate their romances, you know? Oh. Yeah. Is, is it recording? I'm sorry. I have to ask. Rec? Okay, I'm sorry, Luis. Eh? No, no, no problem. Nervous. It no. stops sometimes. Oh, it does? Yeah, and so um, going back to math and YOLO, mm-hmm. right? So I don't know where YOLO you... YOLO Sochitl. YOLO nah. Yeah, yeah. Were you preparing Nayeli for something with that scene with when she finds out about that? Yeah. It felt like... Um, yeah, it's a foreshadowing of... I don't want to wreck the book, but yeah, yeah. Her surprise is surprise is that they're gonna okay, okay. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, because you're you're also trying to compose music. I mean, even though this book was intended for fun, I was trying to make art as well, you mm-hmm. know. So I, I wanted to make sure that the elements moved, and you know, la vampi. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. she meets el brujo. El brujo, that was amazing. You want to know about el brujo? <laughs> in I live in Naperville, Illinois. Okay, so it's outside of Chicago, mm-hmm. puros ricos, mostly white folks, but there's a there's a bunch of raza that work almost invisibly, mm-hmm. not in ranches or things because there aren't any, but you know doing a lot of work. And this guy is a busboy in a restaurant. The restaurant's called the Pancake House. Easy name. Uh huh. And we were in there, Cindy and me, having breakfast, and I llega este chaparrito. He's got long hair and a ponytail, covered in tattoos. Satan. You know, six, 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 um, and in but he looked like a, he looked like an Aztec carving. Era de la indígena, you could tell, right? Mexican. Yeah, Mexican. Orale. Small, and he's walking back and forth. And I said, Cindy, check that guy out. He's Mexicano. He's a Mexican guy. Okay. Check him out. And so he went by, and I said, Oye, amigo, cómo estás? And he stopped, and he looked at me. Like this, and I said, "No, no, no, no! I'm not with the border patrol." I, I said, "I'm from I'm Tijuana." Scared. He's like, "No, see, sí. you know," because okay. the first reaction was like, "Oh, oh!" Uh-huh. Right? And uh, so we started to talk, and we became pals. And he, heavy metal guitar player, oh, but um, straight edge. He'd never smoked, never drank liquor, never taken drugs, but he mm. liked Satan. You know, yeah. that kind of guy wanted to do heavy metal. And he was from Mexico, from Mexico City. Mm-hmm. Um, and his parents were old and had he was their only child. And he gave up his music career and came undocumented to make money to support them. And he was sending his money back. He was living in somebody's extra bedroom. Mm-hmm. He rode a bicycle six miles to work every morning and six miles back. In wow. Back. Just the most <gasps> wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I are I, you still in touch with him? Or? I haven't seen him for a while because okay. um, we haven't gone back to the restaurant in a while. But whenever I go, I bring him CDs, you know, and and, and that was nice. Now, Vampi was completely invented. I thought it would be funny to have a goth from Sinaloa because you in don't the expect tres camarones. it. In no. Tres camarones. no, no, no. You don't expect it. So when the book came out, mm-hmm. uh, one of the one of the nephews wrote to me. And it turns out that his daughter in Culiacan was goth. Wow. And she thought I wrote that for her. Oh, really? And she told him, Tio Luis understands me. Ah, <laughs> that's nice. So you became yeah. your favorite uncle? I guess, for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I was, when I was uh, reading about, you know, Bampi and the things that she likes, I, I thought like, well, yeah, that's like a, Typical teenager, no? There's always a, a weird one. 
in Always. my case, I used to be more like the rock rocker, really? the weird one. I so, knew, I knew, I liked you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't. I didn't find myself. Pues sí, Jim Morrison Andale. me gusta mucho, la verdad, eh? Yeah? Sí, and I saw that something... You like Jim Morrison, right? I like Jim Morrison a He's lot. He's really amazing. Yeah, I love Jim Morrison. I once got... I shouldn't even say this, but this is good for gossip. But I started getting texts from... This guy, I get a text that says, I really liked your book, Jim. And I looked at the... It was Jay Morrison. No. Yeah, and I said, wait, wait, wait. Jim Morrison? He said, yeah. And I said, Jim Morrison Morrison or some other Jim Morrison? Y me dice, I am not dead. I was not buried in Paris. Ay, Luis, come on. I swear. No. And then disappeared. I could never find him again. What? I know. I was like, please come back. This the is- one, but the one thing I said to him is, if this isn't a joke... I get to write the book about this. Okay? You have to write that book. But there's Now no I'm book because he never came back. Maybe you can make the rest up and then he's going to come back. It was just somebody messing with me. But I That's just for cool that minute, joke. you say, what if, what if he, if, what if it's true? But no That's more. a nice, a nice joke. But see, the thing about, okay, the thing about all of those culture things in the story is I'm also writing this. I mean, I'm, I'm writing this to, you know, so that. Mexicanos won't be mad at me that I'm not appropriating things uh-huh. incorrectly, but also I'm trying to teach North American people something. Uh-huh. And one thing I've been telling people is you don't understand that there, in in a very real sense, there is no border anymore. You can build walls all you want, but messaging, electronics, YouTube, the whole world now is connected. Everything is out You know, there. Mm-hmm. if you go to Japan. They have cholos in Japan. They have low riders. Se visten the pachucos in Japan. It's amazing. You know, mm-hmm. Gustavo Cerati is a superstar. You know, in England, in in France, from mm. from Buenos Aires. So, I thought it would be really eye opening to realize that these girls in Tres Camarones are watching the Sixty Nine Eyes goth band and dancing, basically. Uh, you know, Korean pop dancing mm-hmm. to goth music from Finland. That's, yeah. You know, that the whole world is connected now. And also, um, when they keep going up and up or traveling to Kankakee, and then they start <laughs> feeling that they're not as amused as they, you know, at the, from the beginning. It's, and a, it's, a, it's a wonderful adventure at the beginning. But, you know, mm-hmm. Nayeli is betrayed over and over and over. Even Tia Irma betrays her because she just wants to find her old boyfriend. Of course. And by the time you realize and she realizes, what she really wants to do is find her father. Mm-hmm. And the, the journey to Kankakee is the journey we used to take almost every year. That same road. So the place they, you know. From the, where to where? Um, we used to go from San Diego. Uh-huh. Up 15, get 70, go across 70, go all the way across the United States. The whole, it's the same, st- the same journey. So if we drive, we're going to find all this. We should. Let's make a video. Come on. And go. I think that's so important for, um, that you're not, as, as I, you're not making anything up besides the characters and the fictional story, but it's based on your own experience. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of its lived experience. So mm-hmm. before we started, we were talking about Nayeli herself, mm-hmm. which I want to talk about a little bit. So Nayeli is a real person, okay? Um, she came from the Tijuana Garbage Dump, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about the Tijuana Garbage Dump. Okay. Um, you know, it's a place, because of my earlier books about that area, I, I was sometimes sort of like a tour guide for nervous gringos who wanted to see it. <laughs> And I would get, you know, I would get deacons of churches from Indiana, you know, say, Louis, can we go look at the dump? I'd say, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we'd go in and we'd show, you know. Mm-hmm. So I had a long history with them. And I've known Nayeli since she was born. Wow. She's the daughter of a, of a woman who was a, a little girl when I wrote my first books. Um, And a long story short, we did a This American Life episode. You can, you can hear Nayeli and her mom. It's called Trash on oh. thislife.org. You can take a journey with criticism and hatred, or you can take a journey with an open heart. Totally. And what, yes. I, what I liked about the characters 
And you can see now why I was thinking about people I had actually met or actually loved because I had, I had a feeling for how they saw the world. Okay. Mm. So this is like a, it's full of characters that, that, how would you explain, like if we put like a category on top of people that is like magical or, um, a com because they are very particular. They are, but aren't we all? Yeah, but oh, maybe <laughs> if we have a big group of people, maybe one or two could be very interesting, but not everyone. But here, everyone is interesting in their own way. Well, that's, that's good to know. Way. Um, I, I don't know. I just... You know, again, though, a lot of that's inspired by my family mm. and a lot of it's inspired by Tijuana itself because mm. there's no more interesting town in the world. <laughs> you know it's true. You know that house that's the big giant naked woman? Oh, yeah. Ay, que barbaro. No, that's why... I, it... I used to wish I lived in that neighborhood. Really? I've kid. always wanted to visit Mira. that house. I've always. got pictures of her, you know. <laughs> um, you know, and that, that Nortec song, Tijuana, makes me happy. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that song. Um, and Sinaloa, if you come to Rosario, there are more amazing characters in that town than I had ever seen. Oh. So it's always a love song, you know, it's always a love song. And, and the first half, it's interesting, and you might find this really interesting, in the, when it's time to do the Spanish version, mm -hmm. they always get me when I'm on tour, going from city to city for months, mm -hmm. and they're like, we need a Spanish version right away. I was like... I don't have time. And my, my primo, mm -hmm. Enrique Hubbard Urrea, okay. is a, 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 an ambassador. He was uh, Mexico's ambassador to Brazil, the oh, Philippines, wow. Belize. And he was the attorney general here mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, wonderful. He's from Sinaloa. And so he did a translation for me. I was like, great. You know, le pagaron un montón. That's great. But he told me something really interesting. He said, you know, primo, the first half of the book... In the American version, it's so lush and so amazing and exotic and iguanas mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. jaivas and mangos. Mm -hmm. And then he said, it's funny, when you get to the American part, it speeds up. It's more like Jack Kerouac. That's because mm -hmm. the uh, American reader already knows that stuff. He said, pero si llegas con... Oh. Mangos y iguanas in Mexico were like. So well, and it also could be like the way we live here, no? It's everything is fast, like fast food, it's different. fat everything. It's different. And whether you you take the time. So the Spanish version has a, a reverse energy. Que, mm. You know, let's get through the Mexican stuff because we all know it, so we understand it. Yeah. Pero que es un slurpy, you know? What claro. is that? 7-Eleven, uh, yeah, and why, why is there a 6,000 pound prairie dog, and so he kind of changed gears on me, mm. and it was interesting because a lot of times I will meet Mexican readers, and they're like, oh, that Spanish original is so much better than this English translation. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. I don't say anything, I say, pues, se vivió en español, so in a real way, I mean, this is the translation if you're thinking about how the stories came or what I heard. Mm -hmm. It was all in Spanish. And then you move it over into English. Yeah. And then my cousin moves back into Spanish. Wow. I would never thought about that. Yeah. It's just the secret life of a book, right? The secret life of a book. And Luis, can we um, talk about the, what, what we um, mentioned about Juan Rulfo? And so I was, I was yeah. asking Luis that in Juan Rulfo's book, the, the Wind, it's a silent character. Sure. And how in Into the Beautiful North, the road is a silent character, even though we're listening to it all the time. So do you want to explain what happened with the fisherman and Nayeli? Sure. Um, you know, if you think about Rulfo, the wind, that's my favorite Aztec god, you know, a hecato. <laughs> and I always think of him as kind of a hip you know, a hip god. Oh. I don't know why I imagined that wind god dressed in a zoot suit outfit with a hat. <laughs> y llega y platica contigo. That's nice. I don't know why. But so if you remember early in the book, they take a trip down a river, mm -hmm. all of them, mm -hmm. first. With the on um, tirma. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the, the road is really a river. They're going mm -hmm. down there. It's almost like a Huckleberry Finn, you know? It's almost like mm -hmm. a, a, a Mark Twain for Mexicanos, you know? They're going down this river. And mm -hmm. it takes them to wonders and horrors. Everything that happens to mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. is a product of this journey. Mm -hmm. 
because again, it's the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it takes them up here to the North County where they see balloons and then they stumble into a migrant camp yeah. and skinheads attack them. Yeah. And then Nayeli, you know, and, and that scene uh, is very strong. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, it, this is a, like part of the chapter, no, not a scene. Yeah. I'm imagining a movie in my head. Yeah. Oh, right. we can talk about movies if you want. <laughs> but um, so w when they go on this journey heading toward Kankakee, Illinois, mm -hmm. to find her father, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they go up into the Rockies for the first time. And she see, she's always wanted to go up in mountains. She's always wanted to see snow. She's never even really been cold. Mm -hmm. Like, of you know, course. my cousins in Sinaloa, in Sinaloa never. forget, they're never cold. Yeah. It gets to about 90 degrees and they put on a sweater, you know, mm -hmm. like frio. Yeah. Um, so she's up there and there's a fisherman and she's cold and it could go a couple of ways. Here's this big white man. They're alone. Tacho's in the car, asleep, whatever. He's bearded. Mm -hmm. And here's this lone young Mexican woman. And... What you want to do is believably be counterintuitive that what might be threatening is not. He gives mm -hmm. her his coat. Yes. He's talking to her about fishing. He's the fisherman. And an eagle goes by. And I, I was telling you when the camera turned off that... <laughs> that know, was her secret. It was, yeah. That was God <laughs> stopping the camera. He's like, don't reveal my secrets. I know. But... uh you know, that's, that's, that's kind of a, a parable about Peter the fisherman. That she is stumbling into grace uh, on this journey. To keep going. To keep going, but also that she's got a blessing upon her. Mm. And, you know, that in, in old, a lot of old writings, that eagle represents Christ himself. So, you know, it might be Peter the fisherman taking care of her a little bit and wishing her well mm -hmm. and the eagle goes over and then she can go on to this ultimate heartbreak I think which I won't talk about but I know but uh, you know so those there it, it, it is a it's a journey of initiation mm -hmm. the whole thing yeah because actually when she got there and and Tacho was sleeping in the car and I was afraid, like, is this fisherman a nice guy at that point? You don't know. I know, exactly. You're, you're starting to feel unsafe with yeah. them in the car, like, while you read. It's like, are they, you're keep, you know, even being an uh, Iraqi, it's better than being a Mexican at, at one point, no? Like, because everyone is so racist. It's true. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't think people even, I don't think people understand. And, you know... I mean, my brother died four years ago, and, you know, we're, we're, we're driving to funerals, and people are holding up signs on 805, go back to Mexico, you know, build a wall, go back where you came mm -hmm. from. Um, those kind of things people just don't understand. And so when I'm writing a book like this that's, mm -hmm. that's admittedly intentionally charming and, and fun, but there's a lot of tragedy in it. Mm -hmm. And when moments that have actual uh, kind of shocking anti-Mexican sentiment, I spring them unexpectedly because that's how it happens to people, right? Exactly. You're at the yes. zoo and someone comes and says, you're going to get thrown out of my country. And you're like, what? what? I was... Yeah, or like, I don't speak Spanish. And then you clearly, yeah. you know, you can see that they speak. Yeah, and it's right. like, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. And you go back to your English. Right. And yeah. imagine me, I... I Mm -hmm. Some of my cousins say you're like a you're like a Mexican CIA agent, you know. Why? Porque no saben que soy mexicano. Claro. Right? Yeah. I could be. You're very I could, bueno. I could walk through an ice raid. I'd be like, yeah, Just go no Dallas time. Cowboys, man. They'd be like, see you later, buddy. So long. I know. And then as I leave, I was born in Tijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and then you run. No, no. You leave it's just an accident of, of you know, it's, it, it's not like we choose where we come from. No. But we should love where we come from. And in my mom, I was super blessed because my mom was American. My dad was Mexican. Mm -hmm. My dad was the most Mexican ever born. Era pero mexicano, mexicano. Mm -hmm. You know? And my mom was as American as you could possibly be. And so she never, you know... And their marriage didn't work out. But I was raised twice at the same time. Mm -hmm. I was raised to be an American boy named Lewis. 
Uh -huh. And I was raised to be a Mexicano. Luis. Luis, or cabrón. <laughs> Um, that's funny. Yeah, but that's that's the way it was. So I, I mm -hmm. at the time, I d didn't think that was much fun. Now I'm very grateful because I got two full upbringings at once. And it's given me a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. you know, to, to not only read cross-culturally, but to communicate, you know, trans language, to listen to music in various languages. And then all of a sudden you can understand a little Italian. And understand. You know? Yeah. Yes, like um, um, the value of writing this book and all the work that you've done about immigration and the importance of being ethical when mm. writing about this kind of subjects that is, it's not a trend, it's something that, that happens and a lot of people are going through this horrible um, journeys, no real journeys across the desert and we we know about it, but like putting that into a book in an ethical way. Like, how can you, how difficult is that to, to accomplish this? Like a book like this and the ones before you've written? Uh, I guess it depends on your outlook or why you do it. You know, if I'm writing about people I love, it's not difficult. If I'm trying to write about some interesting little brown people doing some weird little brown people stuff, there's something wrong there. You see what I'm saying? So I... You know, again, I, I worked in the Tijuana garbage dump. I worked in orphanatorios. I worked, you know, with, with people with nothing. And so I, I love them. They're people I know and I love and I, I want to represent them. So everything that I've ever done, I've tried to bear witness. Mm -hmm. You know, even to writing about the Border Patrol, mm -hmm. which was hard for me. And they didn't want me around, you know, and... Mm -hmm. uh, And we, we got to know each other. And we got to, I learned a lesson. You have to be, I'm, I don't think I'm very humble, but you try to remind yourself to be humble. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had to realize that I had been prejudiced against the Border Patrol. And they knew it. And yet, when I worked on the Devil's Highway book, mm -hmm. they forgave me and trusted me Something happened there, which was fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've got, that's my rule. You know, I've got to actually be telling the truth, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And some writers don't. Of course. And we as readers, it's important to have authors like you, because reading a book like this, it, ma it made me feel like you've been there, you know, and, and, I feel that I can trust you and that I can trust the narrative. No, <laughs> well, it's, just, it's not. It's not just fiction, and and that's why I started like saying that I was crossing the border every day. Why, when I wasn't reading, I was listening to it. No, people people give me a hard time about the the audio book because I do all my own audio books. But that one, I thought I'm I would have sound... loved to listen. Yeah, to but you, can you imagine but... me trying to act like a bunch of teenage girls? I'd, I'd feel silly. <laughs> so they had an they had well, an actress. See, and people actress... complained because she doesn't cuss well in Spanish. Claro. I said I've never could... listened to it, so I don't know. But she was very. You nice. never listened to it. No? I don't know. You know, no. I've, I I don't reread my books. I certainly don't listen to my own audiobooks. Okay. No, no, no. Lo aguanto. I'll never no watch. Lo I'll never watch. No. Are you kidding? No way. <laughs> And I'll never watch At this. At night, before going to bed. Yeah. Like, I mean, say, oh, Luis Urrea, wow. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no you have I can't a point. do that. I can't. No, but oh, thank you, because um, I appreciate that you have that honesty for this kind of subjects. Not everyone crosses the desert, not even as, as journalists. Not everyone crosses, you know, to write or oh, to... I... So... We can tell that you know, and, and it's, well, better. it's better than, because you're doing it with love, as you said. So that add, adds to everything. Yeah, but I, you know, I, 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 sometimes people argue with me, usually men, mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I, have, I have these writing rules. I teach a lot of writing. And I always tell my writers, fill your pen with love or don't bother picking it up. And sometimes men are like, love, what are you talking about? I have rage, man. I have to, you know, I'm representing important, angry things. And I tell them, I didn't say fill your pen with big-eyed, sad kitty cats and weeping clowns. Or mm -hmm. Love is hard. Mm -hmm. Don't you get it? 
you know that father that drowned trying to get across the Rio yeah. Grande with his baby? Love is a ferocious thing. It's a strong thing. Um, and so that's, that's important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, just as a sidelight, and I think, I think it'll mean something to you. So, um, one of the things I like to do is fundraise for people because, you know, you've got to put, stand on the line for what you believe. Mm-hmm. And so we were down in, in Tucson, my wife and I. Um, I did a fundraiser for the No More Deaths group, okay. you know, who put water stations in the yeah. desert. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was very nice. We had to raise a lot. That's but nice. there's another group that has actual life-saving tanks okay. of water okay. on the Devil's Highway itself, the Camino oh. del Diablo. And they had put in a water tank, and they named it the Luis Alberto Urrea water station Ah. and it made me cry Ah. and they said do you want to see it and I said are you kidding Mm. you know I'm never going to get any kind of award or check or trophy or as important as that of course so we went out we drove out there it took hours it's the most far the farthest western part of the devil's highway Mm. they put it there Um, and uh, we stood around it and they got out my book and they read a chapter like it was the Bible or something. I just thought this is incredible. That's great. But right near it, there were two abandoned plastic water bottles and a little child's shoe in the desert. You see? And so that tells you, that reminds you what you're trying to say. And it's near a Border Patrol station. And I had talked in that book that the Border Patrol mm-hmm. built and put up life-saving towers of their own to help people. So my tank is here, and about a quarter mile away, there's the Border Patrol tower. And people can actually push the button, and Border Patrol will come. It's the weirdest thing in the world. And um, what really touched me is the, they said, is it okay if we add Cindy's name? And I said, yeah. So yeah. it's the, the Luis and Cindy. Urrea. That's amazing, Luis. I, you know, I can retire. You know, to, to think that you typed some words and now somehow those words are helping someone who's lost not die. Okay. You know. Getting some water in the middle of the desert. Yeah. It's yeah. really, it's, it's, it's that's the a, best. There's it's nothing the best. better than that. Ah, uh, Luis, pues, I'm so glad that we, that we, that Me you too. wrote this book and that you've written all these amazing books well, about you. immigration because we need to keep reading um, subjects like this and, and, and this is like a very fun piece to read and at, and, and at the same time it's so touching so I really enjoyed it and, thank uh, you so much and, I'm, and, and it feels so like contemporary I would never thought that this was uh, published in 2009 so. it, it just won't go away that's the funny mm-hmm. thing I thought I thought this book was going to last six weeks or something. Yeah. It, I wrote it very quickly. I was laughing all every day. You were having fun. I was having fun. Mm-hmm. And then my editor liked it, and we published it in hardcover. It did okay. But the National Endowment for the Arts picked it for their big read program. And so every year, six or seven cities read it. That's great. I, I know. That's and you know great. what it, the weird thing about this book is? I didn't understand that... I wrote this book for grown-ups so we could say, oh, I remember when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me that teenagers would want to read it. Mm -hmm. So now I spend those trips talking to Racita. Hey, that's so cool. Tons of kids. That want to be like Atomico? Nah. Well, Atomico, yeah. (laughs) No, I I know we're running out of time, but I thought you'd like this. I was in a little tiny school in Texas Mm -hmm. in the Rio Grande Valley or El Rio Bravo Valley, yeah, a little tiny school. And we were eating lunch, and this young man came and sat next to me very close. He said, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah. And he said, is Tacho single? No. <laughs> and I started laughing. I said, he is single. I said, he's probably about 60 now, but I think he'd like you. He was like, <laughs> can go to <laughs> yeah. Rosario. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's happy. It's happy. Pues Luis, thank you so much. No, This has pues, been so amazing. Loca. Chocala bien. Chocala esa. <laughs> thank Pero you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, and an, 
We encourage everyone to read Into the Beautiful North Hope by Louise. Like yes, you're going to love it.